Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page. And remember, if you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. In the pre-scientific societies of ancient Greece, faded aristocrats, heroes, and kings, troubled by the prospects of their uncertain futures, consulted oracles ordained by the gods with the power to foretell clouded destinies settled at birth by three weaving goddesses whose power even Zeus was obligated to obey. The future was, for the Greeks, inescapable. And while it could be ordained in the form of cryptic poems and ominous verses, its path was inalterable, its reasons unknowable, its tragedy inexplicable. It was not until the development of philosophy and later the arrival of the scientific revolution that the tools of prediction passed from the temples of the gods to the observatories of the scientists, and with them came the promise that the future was not only predictable but explicable. We came to know that there are reasons for the motions of the planets, the precipitation of the clouds, and the procession of the equinoxes. Laplace's demon, vested with the knowledge of the locations and momentums of every atom in the universe, could predict with absolute certainty every moment from here on to eternity. And yet, chaotic orbits exist. Their occurrences are near infinite in nature, while humanity's understanding remains hopelessly finite. But our machines offer the promise of better, more accurate predictions. Already superior to humans in behavioral markets and climate systems, they are assuming the roles once held by oracles, shamans, and prophets, ordaining the mystery of an unknowable future, but without reason, explanation, or cause. In such a future, what is the role of humanity, our models, and our science? Are we relegated once again to a place of helplessness, fated to enact the futures ordained for us by oracles whose deterministic calculations predict a universe that we can never hope to understand? This week on Hidden Forces, David Weinberger, Complex Systems, Inexplicable Models, and the Future of Human Prediction. Dr. David Weinberger, welcome to Hidden Forces. Hello, great to be here. The audience doesn't know this, but I was trying to pronounce your name before, and for whatever reason, I was having difficulty, and maybe it's because I'm hungry, and I kept calling you David Weinberger. Uh huh. Yeah, well, that's, you know, up through the fifth grade, I used to get that joke all the time. Oh, really? What did people say? Oh, I. You want some burger with that wine? <laughs> Pretty hilarious. That's really funny. That's really okay. creative. That's really <laughs> awesome. A burger with that wine. I like it. So, David, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful having you on. I'm not surprised that your publisher pitched me on this book. Its title is Everyday Chaos. The subtitle is Technology, Complexity, and How We're Thriving in a New World of Possibility. I understand you're not a big fan of subtitles. They're so carefully constructed. I think they can be really, really helpful. And the subtitle of my prior book, Too Big to Know, takes three lines. I can't even remember what it was, but for many people, that's what they remember from the book. So you know, subtitles can be great, but they're such complex objects to create. Well, the book covers a lot of areas, so it's not really clear where to start. But I guess we could start where, in the area that I found most interesting, 
which is this idea, and in fact, you actually call one of the chapters the evolution of prediction or the evolution of predicting. And this was what I found most interesting, this comparison of machine learning algorithms to conceptual and working models, the way we traditionally do science, and the evolution of prediction through the use of science and epistemology from, you really kind of begin at the Enlightenment, but I actually go back to at least the Athenians, because I think the progression of epistemology and epistemological philosophy plays such a role there. And of course, I, I emailed with you before today, and, and I expressed also my interest in this relationship between moral philosophy and epistemology, given this stuff with machine learning algorithms. That's a, a big word vomit. I just put <laughs> put a lot out there. But that's how you start the book. Maybe the appropriate question to ask you is, what do you think this book is about and why did you write it? What were you hoping to accomplish? Well, those are three different questions. <laughs> <laughs> Take them as you will. Uh, well, so why I wrote this book, I think is, I mean, I can tell you it has to do, I was, but I don't know how important it is. So I'll tell well, you really well, briefly. Or yeah, or what were you hoping to accomplish? What was your objective in writing it? The book started out as a book exploring ideas about that were spurred by the rise of open platforms on the internet. And I was co-director of the Harvard Library Innovation Lab at the time, and my project there was to build an open platform that made available as much of the information that the library had, the metadata about books and whatever, you know, uh, whatever else we could gather, make it available to any developer, anybody on the web, but In any 1980s, developer. 1980s, 1990s? No, this was five years ago. Oh. Yeah. So as with an open API anywhere, a developer can come and use whatever services and data and information we make available in order to do something that we, the owners of the information, hadn't thought about or had thought about, but it's too niche for us to do. And this platform was by far not the first. I mean, it's, these things have a fairly long history one way or another, but it, I've got really interested in what seemed to me to be an important change in how we think about we want to manage the future. Because traditionally, in business and in organizations, you tightly control. You make your product, you anticipate what people are going to want. Mm -hmm. If you're Henry Ford, you know, you anticipate what people are going to want in a car in 1908, and for 19 years, you do not change it at all. Mm -hmm. Tiny changes, and you sell 15 million of them. Mm -hmm. He anticipated user needs incredibly well, and mm -hmm. it's sort of the benchmark. And in product design and development, that's what we did before Ford, and it's what we've been doing ever since until, to a large degree, until the internet came along and it made it possible to do things like an open platform where the product succeeds not by the owner of the product, the producer of it, anticipating everything a user is going to want, right. but says, you know, we can't anticipate, so let's set up a platform where we don't have you to. You launch a minimally viable product. Exactly the same point, right? right. But, uh, and your focus group are essentially your early customers. Uh, in yes. a sense, in a yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, except, they're, you know, it's that's completely right, except I actually think it's useful to remember how unreliable focus groups are. Yeah. Uh, it's a very artificial environment. You're giving them M&Ms, and you're asking them to imagine how they might use this. And mm -hmm. it's a sort of well-known, I think, that focus groups, people will wish list stuff, anything that comes to mind, and they'll be wrong about what they actually turn out to want. Mm -hmm. So with minimum viable product, you put it out and you see what they're actually doing with it. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's the same thing as A-B testing online, mm -hmm. where instead of trying to figure out which would be the best ad, you put the model on the right or the left, a green background, bottom of the page, mm -hmm. you let's give let's, up. And just you know, for those listeners who don't know, A-B testing is when you decide which ad to run based on repeated tests of running two different ads, two different groups of people that are statistically similar and making a decision about which one works better and then refining and refining. And that's the same way that we train machine learning algorithms in many ways. Correct? Yeah, yes. And in the same way. So everybody online does A-B testing. You know, almost everybody. New York Times has done it for headlines even. The thing that's remarkable about this is nobody, as far as I know, nobody tries to come up with a theory of- As to why. Yeah, I mean, and it's very likely that there isn't a good general rule for... So there's a great example in your book where you give the example of the picture of the Obamas in black and white, right? Right before they won the election or right after? It was, it was on their campaign or their site. Fund right, when he was raising. running, first time he was running, yeah. they had a color picture of the family, charming color picture. 
And they found out that when they switched to black and white, which is very counterintuitive, right? Wouldn't you think that mm. the donations went up, the number of clicks on the button went up? It's fascinating because it doesn't mean that every single presidential candidate should exactly. put it into black and white. Right. It just means that that particular picture of the Obamas at that time to this group of people that were seeing it, it was better in black and white. Yes, I think that's exactly the point. That's why I find it so interesting. Normally with A-B testing, you're talking about putting the model on the right turns out to drive up clicks by 2%. Mm -hmm. And that's not nothing, right? But that's 2%. The Obama case happened to be way more significant than that. But even when it's just 2%, it's quite likely that it goes up for some delicate balance of transient reasons because you don't learn a lesson from it. You don't say, okay, clothing ad, always put the model on, on the right. Barbecue ad, model on the left. Indoor, we are not developing general principles and we don't need to because you just run another ad, right? The first 100,000 people see model on the right, second 100,000 see model on the left. Let's do it this, again. this also, we'll get to this later because I was thinking of very philosophical terms about what constitutes an explanation and is causation objective? You know, I gave you the example of the recent Game of Thrones episode. Spoiler, everyone, if you haven't seen are, the, are you, the you're episode. Sure? May I speak for those who have not yet been spoiled? Uh, yes. Can you? <laughs> no, don't spoil it. No, no, no I won't. I okay, won't. Okay. okay. Oh, well, all right. So I, I won't <laughs> mention it. Fine. But there, there was just simply a moment or an important part of the second to last episode of the season. We haven't had the season finale yet. We're recording this the week before the season I'm finale sure comes out. I'm sure everything is just going to be fine. Well, the season finale comes out the day before this episode will publish. But there was an important scene in the second to last episode. That scene would not have been possible if it were not for many other instances throughout the course of the seven seasons, the prior seven seasons. In so many instances where different decisions taken, that would not have occurred, right? So it's very difficult. How would you even point to one objective cause? But then there's also do ontological explanations exist. In other words, for this you know, discussion around the picture of the Obamas, is there such a thing as a sort of base reality explanation for why that is? Or, and so the, anyway. So, uh, man, those are really <laughs> difficult questions and good questions. So I believe in causality. You have to be- You believe really, in Laplace's demon? Yes, I think he's actually very relevant here. And I, you know, I believe in scientific laws. I believe in science. I want more funding for science. I want more explanations, more theories. But at the same time, these theories get applied to a world that is vastly complex and figuring out, because everything affects everything else all the time, all the time in a causal world, everything affects everything. Our example of causality typically is a billiard ball, cue ball hitting a billiard ball. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a sort of classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sure, um, who would deny that there's some causality going on there? But it's not just, the point is, it's not just some causality, it's actually all causality. Mm. Everything affects that. Yeah. We pick out the two balls because that's the thing that we can control. It's a point that Danny Hillis makes. We can aim the cue ball, and so that feels to us like the cause. But the felt underneath the balls on the pool table and the pull of the Earth's gravity and the pull of distant stars' gravity and the photons hitting the ball, all of these actually have an effect because everything affects everything all the time. And so when we think about causality, the issue isn't, oh, there's no causality, at least for me. It's so vastly more complex than the model that we tend to give ourselves. So I'm going to quote Joseph Ford. I sent you Joseph Ford's quote in an email because this is what I thought about in the context of the book. Chaotic orbits exist, but they are like Girdle's children, so complex, so overladen with information that humans can never comprehend them. But chaos is ubiquitous in nature. Therefore, the universe is filled with countless mysteries that man can never understand. I think that is a, a big part of the message of this book, and it speaks to the point of what you're saying now, which is that causality exists, but the systems are so complex that are, as you write, there's a quote I've pulled out of yours, our old oversimplified models were nothing more than the rough guesses of a couple of pounds of brains trying to understand a realm in which everything is connected to and influenced by everything. So I think those things work together, right? It's, And it brings us back sort of, are we just a small, infinitely stupid organism trying to understand this vast complexity and how meaningful really are our explanations? There's another quote, I don't have it written down, but it's one I often refer to. It's of Edward O. Wilson, where he talks about if aliens were to arrive on Earth and 
what would they be interested in? They wouldn't have much use for our science. They are vastly superior, but they would be interested in our humanities. So uh, can we go back to the yeah, Ford yeah, quote? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do agree with that, but I think something has changed which is that we now have technology in the form of machine learning in particular that is able to take account of more, vastly more of these small collisions and chaotic interactions, more particulars, and serve our needs in ways that sort of feel cognitive to us. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a big believer in, in machine intelligence, so I'm putting air quotes around all this stuff, but we didn't used to be able to do this. We did the best we could. We had our miraculously discovered general principles and laws, and then we would limit the amount of data that we used, that we could use in order to try to figure out how some things worked. And we just, be, now we have machines that don't start with general principles. When, with machine learning system, trains itself, it builds a model. It starts just with data. You don't tell it how you think the world works, what the principles are, what the connections that we know about are between, say, the medicine, diseases, cures, symptoms, and organs. We know a lot of this stuff, but generally, you just pour in the data. I am oversimplifying, but uh, you pour in the data and the thing iterates endlessly in finding statistically meaningful correlations among just these little pieces. Mm -hmm. And some from this there might come some general principle we hadn't recognized before, mm -hmm. but that's actually pretty rare. Mm -hmm. Even when we look for generalities and general principles, we often just fail to find them in these systems, at least ones that we can understand. And yet we use them because they do some things better than we do. In some cases, they can diagnose diseases better or predict the weather better. So to follow Ford's quote and to take with what you're saying, when he says that uh, the universe is filled with countless mysteries that man can never understand, it seems that we're moving into a place where that doesn't change. We still can't understand the mysteries, but we're able to predict their outcomes. Yes. And so one of the guesses that the book makes, one of the hypotheses, is that now that we have machinery that enables us to take advantage of this non-understandable chaos, mm -hmm. we're able to see it. When we had the chaos and the set of laws and we were able to do pretty well with it, right? We should be proud mm -hmm. of what we've been able to do as a species. We paid more attention to the laws. And so it's very common for somebody to talk about, oh, that's just an accident. It's merely happenstance. But nobody ever says, oh, that's merely a universal law. And I'm not saying, we, my point is not, oh, those universal laws, they're just merely, the point is the opposite, that now that we're able to benefit by feeding these particulars into a, a system that can output results that we care about, it may be that we'll be able to stop always thinking about the particularity of our lives and our universe as merely, as the mere. Maybe we can lose the mere f from that and begin to recognize and see in front of our eyes at what and acknowledge the basic fact of our lives, which is we live in, in a chaotic Fatal, environment. Chaotic but fatalistic? Is that where you're... No, I don't... I, uh, that's Because uh, isn't that implied in what you're saying? I mean, if chaotic orbits exist, but do we live in a deterministic universe is my question. Well... Uh, so, do you think? This brings us back to Laplace's demon, which you can explain to our audience for those who don't know who Laplace was and what his demon was. <laughs> okay. So I, I'll do that. I just want to make a note. I'm sure. not going to be able to answer your question. I don't know whether, but I don't think the answer changes depending upon whether or not we're able to acknowledge the chaos in which we live. Hmm. So Laplace was the Newton of France. He was called that. He was a genius, maybe at the level of Newton. His contributions were astounding, including addressing problems that Newton raised and sort of working out some of the issues. Newton was very devout Christian, and Laplace was a very straightforward atheist. So Newton had a problem with this because Newton described universal laws. They apply to everything in the same way to everything, and that was new in the world. The ancient Greeks, and I agree with you, by the way, this is one place to start it. You can take it back to the Hebrews as well. The book starts with the Enlightenment because that's the beginning of where we are mm -hmm. now, nevertheless. So Newton had a problem because in specifying that there are universal laws that basically can be used to explain everything, and these laws are simple enough, sort of by accident, you have to wonder, but they're simple enough for humans to understand, there didn't seem to be any room for God. It seemed to be a mechanistic universe that once God created the universe, wound up the clock, you didn't need God nudging anything. There is sort of an interesting detail about, <laughs> about Newton. Comets were a big deal at the time, and Newton, purely in the form of speculation, right, just sort of... I'm thinking out loud when I say this in that mode, said, you know, maybe 
these beautiful elliptical orbits, but because Newton understood that everything affects everything all the time, the combined gravitational pull of all the distant stars should pull the planets eventually out of these marvelous orbits, very pleasing mm -hmm. <laughs> orbits. And so Newton says, I don't know, I'm just thinking, maybe a comet is, comets are thrown by God in order to pull their gravitational pull to nudge the planets back into their beautiful orbits. Mm. Laplace, flat out atheist, and drew the conclusion that Newton didn't want, Newton was trying to avoid, which was, if you had a creature, later got called a demon, mm -hmm. not because he's evil, but because basically an all-knowing Just like Maxwell's God. demon, same yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, idea. Yeah, exactly. Or um, um, Descartes' demon, a conceptual thought experiment. Yes, and I think it's likely, at least in the case of Descartes and Newton, that it's a demon because it's really God, but you can't call that thing God. There's only one right. God. So if you had a demon who knew the state of the universe at any one moment, position of everything, the, the forces and the acceleration, all that stuff, that demon could apply Newton's laws and figure out what the next moment is, and of course then keep repeating it and predict the entire history of the universe and go backwards and figure out everything that had happened from that one moment. That is a universe in which God is unnecessary. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a deterministic universe, mm -hmm. for sure. The fact that this gets driven down in the modern age, we're able to, first of all, we know about chaos, that there are nonlinear systems in which the behavior of something can change with a very small the incremental financial change. Financial markets, the weather. Yeah, I, weather is the classic example, mm -hmm. right? A little change in, I don't know, humidity or something, mm -hmm. and now you have a hurricane. Mm -hmm. Up until then, it was just getting more and more humid, then boom, hurricane. Well, uh, I think Edward Lorenz was a climatologist, right? That's, or a weatherman or some mix of the two or something like that. Um, I think his expertise was in climate systems. I accept that. I, I, could I don't know. Wrong. My I, good friend Google knows. <laughs> I could always ask We him, could but. consult it later, but I interrupted you. Go ahead. The fact that we now are aware that of the chaotic nature of the universe in that sense, you know, nonlinear systems and the like, and are able to deal with massively more data than we've ever been able to because our machines, our computing machines, got mm -hmm. much bigger. We have sensors all over the world and outside of the world. For me, that doesn't change the question, is it deterministic or not? Mm -hmm. It's just the sort of the grains of dust have gotten smaller. And I, it's, I don't know. It's so, too big a question. For so this is a good way to bring it back to where I wanted us to begin in order to give a foundation. <laughs> no, it's true because... Where I was beginning was the evolution of prediction, that we began, human beings began to, in a world where we had no notion of being able to predict the future. For example, we had perhaps certain animistic ideas. If I chanted a certain song, the rain gods would make it rain, or you mentioned the Israelites, their future was binary. You know, at some point it tips and the Messiah comes, right? Or something like that, right? There wasn't a sense of Am I am I misstating that? You um, made some point in the uh, yeah, book yeah. about uh, about how the, sort of different contours uh, of the future. Sure, it's different if you think the Messiah has come or if you are working towards it. Let me give you a different example that I think is maybe clear also from the book. The Egyptians knew when the Nile was going to overflow because it coincided with the dog star. They had, I, I think that's right. With the, the what? The appearance of the dog star. I'm bad at facts. That's okay, but let's say that. <laughs> They would not have what we would call a theory about why it causes. The question of causality itself is an issue. It was a sign. That's a special class of thing. And so you might want to say, well, they can predict that it's going to come when they see the sign, see the dog star. But it's not what we mean by a prediction. To have the sort of thing that we count as a prediction, you need a very special set of circumstances. Because if I say to you, I have a prediction, Dimitri, mm -hmm. you're not going to believe it. But I believe, I predict that tomorrow the sun is going to come up. That's formally, it's in the form of a prediction, but it's not a yeah, good it's example not, of it's a not prediction. A it's not colloquially a prediction. No one, yeah. no one would say, I predict the sun will rise. It's a meaningless statement. Just like saying, I'm going to guess at who's going to arrive. I think this is from your book. I'm going to guess at who's going to arrive at my unborn grandchild's 80th birthday. Yeah. Predicting that would be a borderline case of prediction because you don't have enough information. With the sun, you got too much information, so it's not really a prediction. For there to be as a culture of predictions or predictions in the sense in which we understand them, you need a, a world that is orderly, 
where the order can be known, where there is some sense of causality, not mere coincidence, and it can't be too orderly. Because then, then you're back with predicting the sun's going to rise. And we got that set of circumstances rather late in our history. You know, it's a, more or less an, an enlightenment idea. So I think this is a tricky idea that may not hold up because it has a lot to do with how we use a particular word. Nevertheless, we eventually got to the point where predictions are a real big thing for us. So to just drive that point home, I'm going to take a quote from your book, which is what you just said, basically, but enunciated clearly. Predictions live in a sweet spot between surprise and certainty. A prediction is a statement that attempts to say what's going to happen when there is room for belief, but also for serious doubt and disagreement. So I want to actually rewind back again, because this is why I found this interesting. Because I tried to imagine, when I prepare for these interviews, one of the things I do, I ask the question that I answer in my rundowns, which is, why do I care? You know, what is it? Because I, I might read a book and not care. And then if I ask myself that question, I actually might end up caring about the subject of the book more than, let's say, other books that maybe the caring came to me spontaneously. There's something about meditating on, on the message of the book or the message of the story or whatever it is. And... I sort of put myself in the in the shoes of an animistic aboriginal man or woman or whatever or some sort of pre you know prediction society pre-modern. And so there's this line in the book that I really like it you know at this point we're further along in the evolution of man but I think it's still interesting. You write the Greeks talked about the future not as what lay ahead of them but as what was behind them according to the late Harvard professor of Greek Bernard Knox. The future, he explained, was for the Greeks primordially unknowable, as invisible as what is going on behind us. This resonated with me, this idea that the future is happening behind us. Sounds like it's going to sneak up on us, right? We don't live yeah. like that today, right? And the ancient Greeks consulted oracles, which makes me think a lot about the conversation around machine learning. The Greeks believed that they lived in a fatalistic universe, right? To bring us back to Laplace's demon and determinism. They lived in a fatalistic universe, and there were oracles that could divine your fate. But even then, you couldn't necessarily understand what they were telling you. And it's an interesting thing because we seem, in a sense, and there are caveats to this, there are, there are interpretive algorithms that attempt to understand the methodology of these machine learning algorithms, but... It's interesting to imagine that we might be moving. So we, we went from a world where we had oracles or shaman or whatever that were divining the future. We couldn't understand it, but they were divining it. And we took their predictions at face value or we believed in them to a place where we applied epistemology and reason and the scientific method to understanding the future and predicting it and understanding why we predict it from our conceptual and working models of the world to a place where machine intelligence can provide predictions that are superior to those that are obtained from using our own models that we can understand, but they are predictions that derive from a methodology that we cannot understand. And so when we ask the machines, why, for example, do you tell me that I have a probability of 90% of developing breast cancer and that I should get a preventive mastectomy? Why should I do that and the machine will not necessarily be able to give you an answer, and yet you'd rather go with a prediction with a higher statistical certainty based on prior you know, tests of patients than relying on a conceptual model that has a 50% chance of being right. So you'll do that even if the machine can't tell you. You ask your doctor, why? What, what's the indicator? I mean, is it, and the doctor will, in this scenario will say, well, actually, we don't really understand that. It's some said it's just it's a little bit like at the other end of, of seriousness, of triviality. It's a little bit like the A-B testing where why does the model on the right sell 2% more barbecue <laughs> kits? We don't know. The doctor will say, look, there's some complex set of factors and delicate balance that these systems are able to see, that the model accounts for them. It's too complex for us to see, mm -hmm. but here's why you should do it. It's not because the machine said you should. It's because the machine has been right. Mm -hmm. It says, when it says 92% chance, so far, yeah, it's been 92% chance. At that point, you will very likely take it very seriously. And if it hasn't been tested and, and tried and uh, hasn't been, then you won't. So it's the fact of the machine's reliability, when it is, that's going to move you. 
In most cases, you use these machines, you don't, you know, we use them, everybody who has a cell phone, basically, you know, all your listeners use machine learning all the time. It's managing their spam. It's why, why we don't see spam. It's doing the routing on their maps and the rest of it. It's yeah, also we increasingly don't managing the decisions you make behind the scenes. We did an episode with Shoshana Zuboff on surveillance capitalism dealing with exactly this. Yeah. And she's pretty smart. Yeah. And yeah. it's pretty scary. Yeah, it, is, it is scary. Which brings up a question of what is the distinction between behavioral algorithms or algorithms that that work on data sets which are subject to change as a result of the answers that you're being provided versus those that are, let's say, of natural systems like the weather. My expectation about the weather is not going to alter the weather. But my expectation about, let's say, crime in a low-income neighborhood could actually impact crime in that low-income neighborhood. Or my expectation for sure about the price action in financial markets is going to impact the price of financial markets. Yeah. So there are two senses of this interaction. And it's really important that we understand both. So there's a benign case where there are machine learning systems that learn and based upon feedback loops. And in benign circumstances, that's that's good. We want to, I think, we want them to do that. They get a little bit smarter from seeing how we respond. The much, much more worrisome cases are ones in which the systems in which the machine learning systems are embedded are changed by those machine learning systems. So the predictive policing example, I think it really, and those can be extremely dangerous because mm -hmm. Well, here's the example. So with predictive policing, which is being used, machine learning systems look at some set of data they, they've been given about crime and whatever else, and they predict where the next crime hotspot is going to be. And the police, they're sent there. They start patrolling there, running, you know, patrolling with their cars or on foot or whatever. And sure enough, there's an increase in crime. But that increase in crime is, at least in this example, and very likely, it's because there are more police on looking out for crime. So there are more arrests. And this then confirms that this area, which distressingly often, because of biases in the data, the data, machine learning learns from data, the sure. data reflects yeah. you know, the, biases. Yeah. Data is not, is not objective. You've just confirmed. And because basically nothing is. Exactly. So now you've installed this police predictive system. It's doing its job, and it looks like it's doing it great because, yes, there was indeed more crime there. Thank goodness the police were, were there, but it's a phony sort of confirmation. And then there are all the consequences of deploying significant police squadrons into an area that it's now stopping and frisking more people is and possibly deteriorating relationships between the population and the police, which has a whole set of consequences. I'm going to say all of which are bad just about. So that sort of feedback loop is very seductive and very dangerous. But the good thing about the recognition of this, in part because of people like Soshana Zuboff, but many others who are working in this field, I think it's really exciting and important that so many people are now focusing on this is that what I hope comes out of it, what I think many of us hope comes out of it, is a recognition that these systems need to be designed and evaluated not within the closed loop of technologists who simply look, well, did it predict this correctly? Has it been optimized correctly for it? But rather look at these as systems that are used for social purposes within social environments and that have been designed with lots of human decisions in them. This is not mere operating on data that magically. We've decided what data to put in. We've decided to carefully, as carefully as we can, clean that data to look for hidden biases and correlations that express hidden biases, or we have not. We've involved the people who are affected by these systems and the decisions about what we want them optimized for in the sense of with autonomous vehicles. Do we want them optimized well, everybody wants them optimized to drive down the number of right. highway fatalities. That, that one's well, easy. This is, yeah, the, but do you want them optimized for fuel efficiency? Do you want them for comfort, for travel time, so for that's cost? A, and these are incompatible uh, right. things. Well, so. that's a great segue into a conversation about general artificial intelligence and narrow AI and uh, the importance of value loading and utility functions and the explanatory gap. But before we, we go there, though, I, I just want to say one thing just to tie it off. I think the way that I think about behavioral algorithms is that they are self-fulfilling prophecies. 
whereas a prediction in a natural system is not self-fulfilling. There is no impact on the system of you having an estimation about its future trajectory. In behavioral systems, when you are an agent within that system, you gaining information about the future of that system is going to impact the outcome. And so it, it can be self-fulfilling. It's, it's the reason why if you think if a sufficient number of market participants expects the markets to drop tomorrow, the markets are going to drop tomorrow. And they're not going to drop in the way that you expect it, you know? That's interesting bringing us back to the Delphi's Oracle and Oedipus, you know, and killing his father on the way back home. Yeah, so the Bernard Knox quote, which I really like because to me it, it makes sense to you to me it's really foreign the notion that uh, the future is behind us it seems such a settled part of our metaphorical understanding you know we, we think in metaphors and the future is ahead of us the greeks as i understand them ancient greeks they were deterministic about the big events the fates control your birth and death and your marriage and that you know the big events the ten mm -hmm. pole <laughs> events of your life and the rest of it was basically chaos it was a set of gods who were drunk and squabbling and demons who were just the wild card in life and you know at any moment turtle could drop on your head and kill you but even the gods were subject to fate but fate is the big picture stuff exactly and in the course of right. the rest of it in the modern age we have lost the sense even though it is clearly and it's not just death i mean what happens to you every day in ancient greece was the result of crazy factors that had no principle behind them. It was drunken gods. You no know, observable principle behind well, them. Well, no, no rational principle. Well, they had a tragic view. That Greek tragedy arose from the, the understanding that life was full of suffering that was inexplicable. Yeah. You know, people <laughs> dying uh, suddenly. And that, again, the, the, that's the notion of tragedy. They, this is what was so remarkable, I think. One of the things that I find so remarkable about, about the Greeks is that they worked through these difficult, difficult feelings. We actually did an episode with Rebecca Goldstein on moral philosophy, and we talked at length about this. This, to me, is what one of the most sort of interesting thing about the Greeks, the way they dealt with the tragic, the tragedy of life, how tragic it can be, and how comical it can be, depending on how you look at it. Yes, that's well put. <laughs> so this thing when we were talking about you were bringing up autonomous vehicles. This is a perfect example, and I said the explanatory gap. What I really meant was the epistemological gap, the gap between what we say we want and what we actually want. And I was thinking about this, all right? I've talked at some length on prior episodes about the work of Nick Bostrom and notions of perverse instantiation. The example for, you know, is, let's say, I, I say that uh, the goal that I give the AI is that I want to maximize human happiness. The AI may decide that the way to maximize human happiness is to make people 50% stupider because you human beings overthink things and it makes you unhappy. And I can say, well, then I, I want to minimize human unha unhappiness. Well, then the machine decides, the AI decides, well, then we're going to kill everybody. That's the best way to minimize human unhappiness, just eliminate human beings. And I think what happens is, and this is a philosophical question, and I wonder what you have to say about it. On a top level... I think we can all agree that we want to be happy, right? There's no difficulty in, in not saying, I want to be happy. I don't know. I'm a Jew, but uh, <laughs> okay. Yes. I've been to Seders. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. Well, I think almost by definition, we can say we all want to be happy. <laughs> we want to be happy. But when you dig deeper into that, so like I said, there is the first problem of, okay, I tell the AI, now we're going into general AI, right? We've moved away, but we'll get back to autonomous vehicles. But big picture, I tell the AI, I want to be happy genie, because the AI is effectively a genie in this sort of okay. hypothetical we're talking about in uh, super intelligence i want to be happy make me happy there you have a problem of miscommunication it's the epistemological gap but if you drill down deeper into the question of what do i really want what do i mean when i say i think there's a point where all of us hit a wall you know there's a point in which when you drill down deep enough you realize you don't actually know what you want you don't actually know what you mean about anything what do you think about that? That's my that's my uh, statement. It's a declarative statement. <laughs> I don't know how much I can support it with the reason. I'm going to hit a wall. I, so I don't know how to think about that, but I want to suggest a way of thinking about it with machine learning that is not aimed at questions like make me happy, the genie question. Okay, sure. Right? So we'll so, go back to the narrow AI, for example, autonomous vehicles, you mean? Uh, yeah, um, mm -hmm. because I'm actually sort of hopeful. I'm not sure what will happen, but I'm sure, hopeful let's go about back the there. effect that machine learning applied to problems like most of the things we apply them to, but let's say autonomous vehicles, may help to shape our way of thinking about moral problems. Mm -hmm. 
That is, I think, well, it's clear that AI and technologists responsible for AI have a lot to learn about fairness, removing bias and that sort of thing, I, without mm -hmm. question. Sure. It also seems to me that there's a lot that we can learn from AI about, about fairness and morality. So take AVs, it's a real thing, right? You don't say to the machine learning, make the best AV you can. What you have to do, and I think it's a really useful thing that machine learning is forcing us to do, is to list what we want those machines, that machine learning to be optimized for. Machine learning folks use optimization in two senses. In one case, it means sort of tweaking it to make it more accurate. It's not the sense that I mean. What I mean is, we want them to fewer fatalities. We want comfortable rides. We want better gas mileage or electrical. You know, we want lower impact. We want longer distances, lower maintenance costs, lower cost of owner or whatever. There's a whole set of values. The only way you can, as far as I know, develop the machine learning for something like that is to say, okay, here's what we want. We want to make sure lower fatalities, but also environmental savings are also really important to us. And property damage, maybe not as much as... I'm making this up, right? But there's those set of values, and the these really are utility functions. These are, I mean, you're referring to a utility function. Right? Um, sure, that's the machine learning way of thinking about it. Our way, as humans, way of thinking about it is either I think about it in terms of optimizations because right. I've been corrupted by machine learning language, or what values we want to support. Right. And as you are instructing the machine learning. You tell the designers of the system, this is what I want. The designers are going to come back to you. We hope they'll, they'll listen, right? And they'll come back to you and say, yo, no, we can absolutely, we can make these things so safe. They're going to drive down the 98% fewer fatalities. And you'll say, yeah, absolutely. And they'll say, okay, but you understand that you also had this value of the uh, shortness of, you want to make the rides faster, good for the economy, right? And so in order to get the numbers down to 98% savings of lives, these things are going to go 20 miles an hour. And there's another thing that mm -hmm. they'll say, because you want comfort. Sure, you want comfort for the passengers. But in order to get the saving you say you want, these things have a threshold for when they're going to put on the brakes when they think they see something in the road, a, yeah. a pedestrian in the road. And if you want it to be super safe, then anytime there's any possibility, it's a shadow and it's a 0.1% possibility, yeah. Put on the brakes. Yep. So if, if your single and sole priority is fewer fatalities, the cars are going to go 20 miles an hour and they're going to be sort of bunny hopping because they're stopping all the time. And one of the reasons we're not going to do that is because we realize there's a sort of second order effect, which is nobody gonna, is going to get in a car that goes 20 miles an hour and bunny hops. And you, then you won't get any of the benefits. So there's machine learning forces us to think about a set of values or optimizations that matter to us, recognize that there are trade-offs, that fairness is not an absolute, that in every moral decision, we talk about principles and elevated voices, at least we used to. These are always, always, always trade-offs. And if we can remember that in machine learning, forces us to remember that, we may be able to have more productive and realistic moral conversations. So here's a problem. <laughs> this reminds me of, to quote Shoshana, who decides who decides. And this is the classic who will guard the guardians, Plato's mm -hmm. from Plato's Republic. In my view, this is not a statement about what should or should not be done. It's just an observation. I think this is totally incompatible. The future we're going into is incompatible with a democratic republic or any form of democracy because there's no way that you can load those values with democratic input. This is why I think you disagree. In other, in other words- Yeah, I do disagree. You but, do. Uh, okay, but I'm so curious how, why you say this. Well, uh, so you've got a very small section, subsection of the population, which is making decisions about how to load these values, right? So, uh, sorry, I'm going to interrupt. I was going to sure. jump in. Do you feel the same way about city planning? That Cities cannot make decisions about whether they want to have bike lanes at the expense of oh, no, more commuter traffic? They can make those. That's a very great point. But I do think probably the distinction I would make is that the implications of that level of power at the city planning level in terms of the architecture and design of the city pale in comparison to what we're describing here, right? I, you know, I'm not so. It's hard to you got a Robert Moses, which is a terrible oh, example. Yeah, that's, of, a, right? that's a great example. <laughs> well, we, so uh, with, it we gone did, wrong. I'll say sure. we did an episode with Hannah Fry where this was actually in her book, and we described this exactly. And you could let our audience know who Moses was and why that is a great example. I mean, he built the Cross Bronx. So that was a big middle finger right through the middle of the Bronx. Yeah. So he, and other things as well. He was the city planner in New York with basically unbridled power. So it's a bad example of a democratic response, little d democratic response, who had 
fantastic visions for what the city should be, many of which are very valuable, but which he implemented without regard to he just didn't think black human should, costs. He just didn't think black people should be involved in those. Well, He was notoriously racist. Certainly the results of what he did skewed racist. <laughs> but he actually, as far as I know, didn't let anybody. He was a megalomaniac in any case. So that's a good example for your side. It's a bad example for me saying, no, we do regulate these sorts of things. This is what politics is. And sometimes it works really well. Sometimes it's terrible. Robert Moses, in many ways, terrible. These days, many ways, everything's terrible. But this is why we have government. So let's say New York decides that, yeah, they really want to push forward with autonomous vehicles for all sorts of reasons. But they are concerned that if they go too fast, then people won't see the city. We'll lose tourists or people won't be able to stop and get out and visit the shops. And they're also worried about what this is going, the skewing towards the wealthy areas and the rest. What is it going to do to bikes, pedestrian life? All those are decisions that they're sort of city planning decisions that the city is actually going to have to make. It is really going to have to make those decisions, as all cities are going to. And they will. And in some cities have broken governments and they're going to corrupt and they're going to do it badly. And some are going to be shining examples of actually consulting and caring and considering all of the people who are affected by all of these changes. Well, it's definitely not to build a Blasio in New York City, that's for sure. I'm from Boston. I have. I would not dare <laughs> yeah. to venture. Well, New York's a notoriously corrupt city, as is New York State. But I mean, to bring it back to Robert Moses, one of the things that we discussed with Hannah Fry were racist bridges. He had bridges yep. that were built that were very low. I think headed towards Jones Beach because he didn't want to have poor people coming to Jones Beach. So that was a clear moral decision that impacted who could go and who couldn't go. But and yet, my real point here, the distinction I draw, is that these are a small number of decisions in comparison to what we're describing with value loading on autonomous vehicles. And there's also still some ability to impact them. It's not so disproportionate where you've got a small section of people, let's say in Silicon Valley, who are making decisions for all of the world. I think that's a real problem. And we it, see it, it also politically in the United States too. For sure. There is, however, increasing awareness of this issue, not only for Silicon Valley in general, but for autonomous vehicles as well. It's not, and it's occurring not just in the US, and there are many, many countries around the world. Germany has evolved a set of ethical guidelines for AVs, which are pretty good. I, of course, don't know how it will turn out. It's a chaotic world after all. Personally, I really do not want the manufacturers to blithely be making these decisions about what values these cars should instantiate. And I think there's a fair bit of pushback and recognition that, no, we really don't want the individual But they are going to decide. That's not at all clear to me. Well, the There's reason a why lot I say of they're regulation underway. But I'm saying even the regulation, they've got to interpret it. They're the ones that are putting those utility functions together. It's not the legislators. Well, so... Brings us back to the epistemological gap. There's an epistemological I, mm -hmm. gap between the engineers and the legislators. And the public, which is saying to the legislators what they want. So I, I will not pretend to have a policy answer, but I guess for a moment I will. <laughs> I have no confidence in it. <laughs> it's plausible and reasonable for a government to say to the manufacturers of the autonomous vehicles running on its highways or its city streets or whatever, that, look, here's what we think are the important optimizations. Lower fatalities, lower pedestrian fatalities, comfort comes fifth, and these are, there are dependencies among them. You are required to support those. You need to tell us that you are tuning these systems to support those values, and you need to give us metrics every month or continuously, because these gonna, things are going to generate huge, these AVs, huge amounts of data. We need the data about how it's fulfilling the optimizations that we have required. It's just like you know putting ingredients on a wrapper. We need to know. We need to be able to audit it. Absolutely, and maybe in real time. And if you're not, then the normal regulatory things, fix it, be fined, whatever. But doesn't that bring us back to the problem of the black box and the fact that we don't know how these algorithms are Doesn't matter. Because it, it, you're it, auditing the utilities, you are, the utility function. You're you auditing are, the subjective values. You are auditing how many people these cars kill. Oh, the outcome. The outcomes. I see. There are other places in the machine learning process where you can ask, where I think it makes a lot of sense to ask for transparency. For example, transparency about the process by which you gathered data and vetted it to try to eliminate as many of the inherent biases as you can. For this part, I'm not sure that you need transparency into anything except the metrics, the results. So this is off the fly off the top of my head. 
let's say we set this ball in motion, fatalities drop by 90%. Let's say that was the target. But fatalities among children jump by 50%. A fantastic point. I'll make it worse for you. Fatalities among poor people. The poorer you are, the more likely you are to die in in one of these cars. Right. And possibly because if it's private ownership, you may not be in the Mercedes that has all of, you know. The reason where I was going with it is just, I was just imagining, for example, children play in the street more than, uh, mm -hmm. or I actually said it doesn't make sense because I was thinking that the cars would avoid neighborhoods where children play in the street, in which case, let's say you'd get neighborhoods that wouldn't be serviced. So certain neighborhoods wouldn't get car service, let's say, as opposed to others, but you wouldn't be able to figure that out. You'd be able to make guesses about why those areas weren't being serviced. It brings us back to the question of what constitutes an explanation. How do you go back and, again, because you don't know what's driving it, how do you fix it? How do you know what's causing this? You just see that something's causing it, but you don't know if it's actually the demand that fatalities drop. It could be something else. It could be, and it may well be that the manufacturer gets told, fix this, not acceptable, full force of the law and the rest of it. Well, you know, we do pretty well at regulating products in this country. The products are generally really, really safe, and they're a set of processes when they're not for, for dealing with it. And so when we send cars back, they're recalled because, you know, they start catching on fire or whatever. The recall, I'm not a lawyer. As I understand it, the recalls don't say, fix the problem with the, and then they say what the cause of it is. They say, stop your cars from catching on fire. And the manufacturer then goes through whatever processes, internal forensics, or whatever, in order to figure it out. We don't need to know how they figured it out so long as the cars pass the tests. There may well be instances in which, in order to know what the problem is, we need to understand what's causing it. That's, mm -hmm. I think, it's not hard to think of examples, so, but not always. Right. So this kind of, uh, I mentioned something else to you when I sent you an email yesterday about our uh, conversation today, and that had to do with the importance of epistemological philosophy versus moral philosophy. Epistemology has traditionally, I think, been the sexier philosophy, right? These are, these are the questions that I don't... You are so... You know, I used to make... <laughs> I have a degree in philosophy, and I, I met my wife in grad school, and I still say, how did we meet? And I consider it a joke. We met in remedial epistemology. <laughs> uh, epistemology is like the driest of the... <laughs> traditionally, so I don't want to draw any personal conclusions from that, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I stand by my statement. Sexy I mean, epistemology is not a <laughs> phrase I've heard before. I'll just put it like that. It's the sexier of the two branches of philosophy, in my view. Moral philosophy, when doing it in school, I didn't major in philosophy, but I, I took a few classes in philosophy, and I studied philosophy on my own. I read a lot of different philosophers. It was, just, it was interesting to me. And what interested me in philosophy were the big questions. You know, what is the nature of reality? You know, how do I know what I know? Again, epistemology, ontological questions, but they weren't questions about what's good. or I, I just, you know, didn't care about what constitutes the good life or what is bad and what is good. I didn't really care about that. Maybe because I was, you know, a teenager and uh, I was more interested in doing as opposed to the implications yeah, of Yeah, so epistemology actions. is just such a natural draw for the teenagers these days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but besides my weird intersecting interests... Uh, I got a PhD in a, with a dissertation on <laughs> ontology, okay? So I, I cannot cast stones. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to me that what we're talking about here is a world. We're moving towards a world where epistemology takes a backseat to moral philosophy. Because if we're increasingly not able to understand the pathways through which decisions are made and predictions are formed, and where we are in a position to have an impact is in setting those utility functions, in determining what values are important, what do we want, what's important to us. Because increasingly, we're creating these genies in a black box, right? That is what these are. They're genies. We don't really understand how they do their magic at the limit, right? We don't understand the particulars. Obviously, we understand the general way that these models work. But as but we, we get... can't, exp in many cases, we simply cannot explain particular outcomes. But isn't the idea that as we evolve, as the decades go by, at the limit, we would be living in a world where everything is a mystery that is being Haven't created we by our machines? we always lived in that world? I agree. Fundamentally, at the very bottom of the turtle shell, <laughs> we, we do live in that world. Which is actually interesting. I'm so sorry, I derailed you with it. Well, I've derailed you. We're sort of derailing. So this is chaotic. <laughs> chaotic orbits, the Joseph Ford orbits. One of the things I thought about is actually at the limit, don't we kind of get to a world where in the ideal scenario, 
if we don't kill ourselves. And there are plenty of reasons to be concerned about whether this is actually going to work. I'm not so optimistic. But let's say we did. We would have all sorts of leisure, right? These machines would be managing our entire lives. The moral questions would be what mattered. But to bring it back to your point, haven't we always lived in the mystery? It seems that what intellectually would preoccupy our time would be trying to understand the nature of our world and and addressing that mystery because all the scientific questions would be irrelevant because what's the point of doing science if the machines we have are arriving at answers that are superior to anything that we can create and so they're doing everything for us and we can't really understand the chaotic orbits. We don't understand what the nature of the world is without basically throwing bones into the wind and sort of divining the mystery. That's a fantastic comment, question, worldview. Uh, it's going to be... So let me uh, try to address some small random points in there. So one of the things that drove my, my interest in, in the topic that became the book is the sense that even though I made the stupid sort of teasy joke that aren't we all, all in the mystery, is that for a long time, I'm going to leave it unspecific, but certainly like enlightenment on, we've always lived in a chaotic world world that is contingent and accidental all the time. We can predict almost everything that happens in our life from whether the coffee pot is going to be warm when we get to work or what color shirt you're wearing. It's all beyond our ability. And we don't care that much, but it's beyond our ability to predict. And we've always been in that world. But since the Enlightenment, and we've had this idea very different from the Greek idea that that's just accidental, and there's it's actually a well-ordered, safe world, at least for the privileged in the in the community. And we can bring order to that chaos with our predictions. That order allows us to make the predictions, and the predictions allow us to go forward and order f further. And I want to stress that this view is one, it is absolutely a view of privilege, that your life is relatively safe, that the turtle isn't going to drop on your head if you're house floods because of a hurricane, you want to sue somebody, you feel bad that there's nobody to sue. I mean, the, this sense of, of order and entitlement and safety. But aren't we all, although we can all get cancer, we can all lose someone we love. We're all subject to caprice. Absolutely. Some are no, more I, than others, I, I, but still. It, I'm it, not saying that this is the world that we thought we inhabited is actually the world. It has always been the case that the turtle that dropped on Aeschylus, guess, yeah. head. Yeah. We live in that world as well, right? Absolutely. But we've been in a type of denial, a safe, comfortable, calm denial, those of us who are lucky enough to be able to persist in that. With the rise of machine learning, the nature of the world doesn't change. It's just as chaotic and full of risk as before. But we may be able to start taking account of that more because our machinery now can accommodate it. We have a way of dealing with it. In fact, benefiting, profiting from it because these machines that take in this chaos are able to produce predictions and efficient sorting and all that sort of thing. It is the same world, but maybe we will get back to the sense that people throughout our Western civilization have had, which is, oh no, you could go at any moment. <laughs> you know, it's just life is wildly contingent. We've managed to mask that to some extent. Maybe now we can start to appreciate the the particulars again. So I want to continue on that thread, Dr. Weinberger. We're going to switch to the overtime. For regular listeners, you know the drill. For new listeners, if you're interested in learning about the subscription, head to Hidden Forces dot io slash subscribe or to patreon.com slash hidden forces and you'll see there we have audio file autodidact and super nerd subscriptions the super nerd tier comes with a rundown david can attest to the beauty of this rundown it's got that's Tyrion and uh what's that guy's name again lord varus the eunuch and it uh, it has all my questions and my thoughts about this episode and and my preparation for it as well as the transcript to our conversation but david i want to thank you for coming on the program well, thanks so much for having me it's been exhausting <laughs> well we're not <laughs> done yet we're going to the really, overtime really so interesting. <laughs> find us on the on our uh, overtime feed thank you oh, thank you and that was my episode with david weinberger i want to thank dr weinberger for being on my program. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded at CMD Studio in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.com.
www.overtimeshow.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.